Hey guys, welcome back. It's Friday. You're sitting on the spotlight. Roy McMillan's in the studio today. Jason Berard. We have a very exciting interview that's joining us from Los Angeles. Megan Atavle. She's the co-founder of Pomotion, co-founder of Lumo Play, um, born Winnipegger and uh, young female entrepreneur doing big things in the marketplace. And we're very excited to have you here. Welcome, Megan, to the studio. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Megan, I guess, you know, the first thing that we always like to ask people that join on the show is, uh, is who are you? Why did we bring you on the show? And, uh, and what do you do? Um, so my name is Megan and I started a company about five years ago, um, completely by accident. Uh, my co-founder Curtis and I were throwing parties after work. We met at a web development company in Winnipeg and, um, we were, we were just really bored at work and started hanging out after work and, uh, scouring instructables and <laughs> learning how to make our own touch screens and stuff. And we started throwing parties to show off the stuff that we were making and, some of the videos from the parties that we were throwing went viral and all of a sudden people all over the world were contacting us and saying, wow. um, we were building things like interactive projections, uh, touch screens, um, cell phone controlled installations, and people just started contacting us and offering us money to set things up at their events or at their promotions. And uh, we just, we, our company just kind of started that way when we realized we could get paid money to do things that we loved doing. Mm -hmm. So you started the company, uh, was it about five, roughly about five years ago? Uh, yeah, we incorporated in 2010. Fantastic. Started the company five years ago. You threw some crazy parties, um, interactive floor and wall digital displays. It blows up. So yeah. where are you at today? Where's your company at today? What, what, what markets are you tapping into? Who's buying your products? Um, so the first year that we were in business, we just did services. People would call us and they say, you know, we want to have a, a miss screen at our event or we want to have, um, I'm trying to think of some of the weirder ones. Uh, we, we've done a lot of building projections. So mm -hmm. a lot of, of like 3d architectural stuff. And we just found that the costs associated, especially cause we were from Winnipeg, the cost associated with going to places and setting up for events and trade shows were just too high. Um, but the one thing that was like requested over and over again was interactive projections. So, uh, we ended up commoditizing that as a software, as a service thing right. and making it accessible for advertisers and creatives so they could create their own content without having to learn how to code. So our, our entire system is code free. Um, and we launched that in 2011 and just kind of grew from there. Okay. Excellent. And then like, I guess for someone who has absolutely no idea about your company or what it does or what the technology does, like, what is it? What does it do or what do you guys like specialize in? If I was just someone who was just like, oh, what do you do? Yeah, um, so it's interactive display technology, but it's large format. So it's not like touch screens where, you know, you're scrolling a website or, um, or engaging with it the way you would with a phone screen. Right. Uh, what we do is we create the software that allows you to project images on a large surface. So, you know, a huge area of floor or wall, and then they interact with people's entire body movements. So oh, okay. we're able to project like ponds on the floor that ripple when you walk over them and the fish react or uh, soccer games where you can actually kick the ball around. Awesome. Those are two of the most popular effects. Right. Oh, well. Okay. That makes sense. And you're everywhere. Like I see that you're in New Zealand, South Africa, Peru, Tokyo, yeah. Hong Kong. Like that, mm -hmm. that isn't easy to get, create that kind of bandwidth for an entrepreneur like yourself. Like how did you manage to secure all these big customers and these big clients? Like how did you do it? A lot of hard work. Um, there was uh, there was definitely a lot of barriers to entry because mm -hmm. there's language barriers in a lot of the countries where this software is kind of taking off. Um, we did a lot of research on our competitors. At the time that we started, there were four really big interactive projection companies, but they were selling the hardware as well as the software, and it was really cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So, like an average display in a place in Vegas would be, you know, between ten and forty thousand um, dollars. So, what we had to do was figure out what market we could target that couldn't afford that but was prolific enough that they would support the software alone like they would be able to just uh, pay for the software and they could handle the hardware and they didn't need a turnkey solution mm -hmm. um, and it took it took about a year of experimentation and market elasticity testing and like a lot of sort of promotional um, events we we were at South by Southwest three years in a row oh, nice yeah, uh, we've done CES, we've done um, Augmented World Expo most recently. And I think like a lot of those were just really good 
they're, they were good opportunities to learn more about our market and what they needed. So that, that was kind of how we grew the company. It was very organic. Speaking of the, like the market needs, like what would someone, is it like what, when someone's thinking, okay, I need this kind of interactive wall, is that really just is it mostly events or is there other applications that you find that people are going to start using or are using right now? Um, there's a, there's quite a few different examples and that's actually made it harder for us to to target our messaging. And it's something that we're constantly sort of uh, re-examining. Um, but the first, definitely the first application is in advertising. There's quite a bit of uh, documented research proving that people, when they physically engage with a brand in some way, um, are more likely to remember the experience. So if you, mm-hmm. one of the, one of our, like one of the best case studies I can think of for this is one of our earliest clients was Air New Zealand. And we uh, were contacted by them while they were sponsoring the Rugby World Cup. And rugby is just huge in New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Like they, ev- everybody loves it. Um, so we made these interactive rugby games that they put in airports and people played them while they were waiting for their plane to arrive. And it was just like a, a lot more, because it was a more kinetic experience, it was a lot more effective in communicating um, Air New Zealand's sponsorship of the Rugby World Cup than like a stationary poster or even a static digital sign would have been. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And then in terms of like, you know, the entrepreneurship in, in Winnipeg, like um, you've managed to hire a few people and I heard you have a pretty interesting recruitment process. What's your, what's yeah. your hiring process like? Well, because our company typically um, spends like uh, most of our employees spend at least like 70 to 80 percent of their time creating new technology uh we can't just hire somebody that has experience you know in web design or in even in app coding um and expect them to do well because they have to constantly be able to learn so we we try to find environments like uh game jams are very popular with us uh where people are, are learning as they go um, where they're yeah. working on projects that, that they don't necessarily actually know how to do um, because you, you end up really quickly discovering people that can handle you know deadlines and stress and working on teams when you're in a 40, 48 hour game jam with somebody and you haven't yeah. gone home for two days and like so yeah, uh, we two colors come out. Yeah, so I mean, either we'll go to other uh, sponsored game jams, we sponsor them ourselves in Winnipeg, or we'll host them in our office. So uh, when we intern people, that's our internship process is we'll we'll bring interns on, we'll put them on a team and we'll give them a, a sort of a very broad game goal and then they are responsible for coming up with the creative and the process and all the code and um, executing within a very short period of time and we'll document and live stream the whole thing so cool cool cool, cool. Yeah. and going back to recruitment where do you go to source a lot of your candidates where where do you find these people obviously you're looking for a very unique skill set where are these people sitting um it's interesting because we come from both my my co-founder and i are uh, self-taught largely. And so, oh. and we both come from community colleges. So um, we're kind of open to anyone. Like we will bring people in who are just interested in making games and have a little bit of experience from like online tutorials. Um, and we also have a very strong relationship with the universities and colleges in Manitoba. So um, typically if we're doing structured internships, we do them with Red River College or Assiniboine Community College. Okay, that's interesting. So you, you, you have that presence in Winnipeg now. People people are, people are know who you are. Where, yeah. And are you downtown Winnipeg? Is that where the office is? I'm from Winnipeg, so I was just out of curiosity. Yeah, we're, we're in the exchange district. Okay, yeah. It's, it's interesting that you've managed to, to, to find some good talent there because it's a limited uh, market in that a, sense, right? Yeah, it's not it's easy. Not a- talent pool yeah, at all yeah yeah and where do you see the future of like you know virtual or augmented reality going where do you really think that is, is it going to be the, the just the standard of what you're doing or um no i i mean we do we have a vibe in the office and we do um work with companies who work on um actual augmented reality applications and virtual reality applications and one of the reasons that I'm in the place that I'm in in Los Angeles is the largest uh, VR studio in town is right around the corner. So I go to meetups there and stuff. I think there's a an interesting convergence. This tell me if this is like too nerdy, but <laughs> 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 I think there's an interesting convergence between. Um, people building virtual worlds and the data that we're collecting now, because we've got all this geospatial data um, and where augmented reality was just kind of like a nifty little toy, like a basically like a glorified pop-up book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, a couple of years ago, now you can actually geotag like 3D and virtual objects into actual physical space. And I think that that um, that's kind of like where it's at now. And for the future, giving average people, um, and by that I mean non-coders, the ability to affect and build their own virtual environments, I think is, is that's where it's headed. And there's a whole bunch of different components to that. There's like the content creative tool, creation tools, which is what our company focuses on. Um, there's also just like access to data um, and the ability to make those kinds of resources relevant. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, like a few years ago when everybody went super crazy about Google Glass, uh, I think we all kind of had the same vision in mind that we would be able to wear these these goggles and they would tell us more about the world around us than we were able to, to know on our own without them. Um, and the biggest sort of like, the biggest reason I think that that didn't take off was because Google prevented things like facial recognition from being implemented. So I couldn't just walk into a bar and like look at somebody and learn something about them <laughs> through the glasses. Yeah. Uh, but I think that like by putting the power to enter that data into your own world, um, I think that's what's going to get past that. Uh, and the really big hurdle that we have is that a lot of people who want to do it are from the creative side and they don't necessarily know how to use the technology. So that's, I think that's the, the challenge that our company is trying to overcome. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And what makes you so passionate about it? Like why are you so passionate about interactive, uh, like interactive production? Projection? It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's exciting. Really, when we first started doing it, like the reason that we did it at parties and stuff like that was because it was um, it was basically like a step past like normal video games. And one of the things that I noticed right away that kind of got me super excited about it was I used to be absolutely addicted to Guitar Hero. Like I just I thought it was the best game ever. And um, I would have huge parties where people would come over and play it but everybody looks at the screen they don't look at each other there's not like there there's a, a lack of social connection in um in video games and so uh interactive projection and virtual reality and augmented reality prevent that because they allow you to look at each other mm -hmm. like and mm -hmm. actually engage with each other uh and interactive projection was just the easiest thing for us to get into at the time the the barrier to entry was lower because we were self-funded we had to like uh, like we literally got a lot of our equ equipment at pawn shops when we first started out right. mm -hmm. um so that was like really the the biggest sort of motivator behind it was getting people to engage socially while they were playing games. Yeah. And then once we started deploying it, we noticed like two things. One, that kids were incredibly, incredibly enthusiastic about being able to play a video game while using their whole body. And it's different than the Kinect or the PlayStation Move in that you're like literally inside the game, like you're jumping yeah. into the game. Um, and then the other was that women and men both played it equally, which is actually like, we've done testing at, at parties. Uh, I have video of a demo that we did at the Indiegogo party at CES, and oh, it wow. was a party in a bar, and there were a lot more men there than women, but when you watch the, the game screen that we had, um, they had like video games and stuff like that set up too. Uh, and the the number of people that would go play, you know, like old Atari games or console games, um, the majority of them were guys, but on our system, it was always 50-50, like throughout the night, even though there were way, way more men there than, than women. And I think that it just kind of changes the dynamic when you can look at each other while you play. I don't, I don't actually know why that happens, but it happens again and again. Yeah. So It's very um, interactive. Yeah, it's interactive and it's like, I think there's just less less of a sense of competition. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not, like, I, I'm really curious about why that happens, but it's definitely, something. there's definitely something there. Yeah. So it was something that we, we really wanted to make accessible. And yeah, with yeah. you being self-funded, like what, what is like one or two, one to three things that you would offer up as advice to any other entrepreneur that right now just incorporated their company, but they're probably <laughs> nowhere near funding? Like, what would you say is like the number one thing to look out for? Uh, it depends if they're in Winnipeg or not. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of Winnipeg. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think like we were self-funded by necessity. It's not, it wasn't yeah. something that um, we chose. Like we, were, we, yeah. we weren't in, if we had no, we didn't know anything about, you know, pursuing venture capital or anything yeah. like that. 
Um, and I think even if we had, we would have had a really tough time with it just because our business model was so sketchy at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I think like my, my biggest piece of advice is like, and I, I, this is in the whole, this is part of the whole lean startup methodology, yeah. uh, build a minimum viable product, like make that your priority, build something that is the very, very, very smallest version of what you want to make yeah. and then make it available and see if people yeah. want it. That's yeah. right. Test it. Something see what the tangible. feedback is. I want to talk about the entrepreneurial grind, uh, Megan. You know, building sure. a business like this, you've obviously been been around for five years. The company's making money. Uh, yeah. What are some? Of, what have been some of the biggest challenges and, and hurdles that you have to co overcome as an entrepreneur? Uh, um, money, for sure, is the biggest hurdle. Like you, yeah. you really like the the stress of struggling from from month to month is really hard. You're talking about like, you're talking about personal income too. Like you're talking about like yeah. giving up that. Yeah. Okay. Business income yeah. produces personal income. Yeah, I know. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <Like> money. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. Okay. Someone like, buy my product. Yeah. Some people yeah. are, are in a position where they can maintain a day job while they're sort of starting out. Um, we weren't, we weren't really in that position because we had a very limited amount of time to figure out what our business was. And I think that most startups are in that position the first year where you don't actually have a business. What you have is a group of people who are trying to figure out what your business is. Yeah. Um, totally. And I think like that makes it really hard to make money. And so, um, I guess like the, the biggest thing we learned out of that is that it's okay to do crappy work. Like it's okay to, I, and I don't mean your work should be crappy. I just mean it's okay to take projects that don't fall in line with what you want to do in the long term yeah. to fund the short, the short term. And it's really imperative to figure out what those projects are or could be, you know, within the first couple of months. Uh, like, like I said, my co-founder and I came out of a web development um, studio, so we had a lot of of web development experience, yeah. and we were we were literally doing websites to fund building what we wanted to build. Um, and I think like so, we got over the money hurdle mostly by uh, n sort of finding a balance between mm -hmm. focusing on what we wanted to do long term and what we had to do short term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of time in the mornings, a lot of time in the evenings, a lot of coffee, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it definitely it's this is the first year that we've all worked relatively normal hours so. oh yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's only gonna get worse it's only gonna get worse yeah I mean, actually if it gets worse you're doing it wrong i think like you you kind of want it to get better yeah, <laughs> over yeah. Time. totally totally <laughs> but it seems like you're growing seems like you're doing big things um which is going to lead me into my next question what's lumo play all about what tell us about that company that you started this promo um oh, yeah yeah, so 2013, um, well, like I said, we noticed like this was a really compelling platform for kids, but the money was all coming in from advertisers. Um, right. and getting contacted by a lot of schools and a lot of um, people from sensory labs and hospitals, uh, particularly like hospitals that were aimed specifically at children. So uh, rehabilitation um, so cool. programs and stuff like that. Uh, but the problem was it wasn't so much the cost of the software it was just that they don't necessarily have it teams um like daycares yeah. have somebody that can come and hang a projector from the ceiling i was just thinking you know put this in a daycare or a kindergarten class they'd be all over it <laughs> yeah. yeah so so in 2013 beginning of 2013 we started talking like maybe we should put this in the form of a toy like maybe we should make something that we can mass produce and make available to mm -hmm. families and daycares and um, so we started doing a bunch of research and by the end of 2013 th in the fall I would put together the first prototype of Lumo which is a small interactive projector meant for the home um, and we got accepted into a hardware accelerator so we started that the following year and uh, it was in San Francisco so that was la fantastic 2014 was when I moved to California um, and uh, we started kind of like iterating it. I went to China, we sourced the, the equipment, and then we ran a crowdfunding campaign earlier this year that um, was successfully funded. Nice. Uh, so we have, I can show it to you if you want to yeah. see it. I have, I have it right here. There's, this is what it looks like. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's really small. Um, so that's, and it has, a, that's a sellable model right now, or is that just prototype still? Um, this is a prototype. The, the sellable models that we're putting out right now are just the dev kits. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so we're delivering, we're starting to deliver the dev kits actually at the end of this week. It's one of the reasons that I'm heading off to China at the end of the week. Cool, fantastic. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's been a Exciting. real challenge. 
we've never done hardware before and it's a lot harder than is that, software. Is, is that the projector? Is that what that is? It's the projector, the computer, and the camera. So, so everything that's, all is gonna, that's all gonna go, say a, a daycare would purchase something like that, that would go in the daycare, and then danceable floors would show up with currents yeah. or quicksand or whatever it may be, and then the kids yeah. would fall in love with it. Yeah, and awesome. the, thing, the thing that makes it unique is that they can make their own games for it. So uh, that's the part that we're being issued a patent for is the content creation. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, anyone can take a projector and a computer and a camera and hook them together and make it interactive, but totally. um, we wanted to give people the ability to make their own games and their own effects and like educational content and stuff. So we've developed this entire app market around that. Cool. Okay, so uh, backing up to the, the prototype that you've got for Lumo Play, you mm -hmm. brought it to Indiegogo and you raised your, your money. What did you raise and in, 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 in what kind of period of time and, and now what? So and how did you do it? <laughs> well, we raised about $86,000 in a period of a month and a half. Wow. Um, and uh, we did it, I, I, the, primarily it's early adopters. So a lot of people that want to develop for it and a lot of the people like, Basically, what we did was um, around 2012, we started keeping the names of all of the people that contacted us and said that they wanted a turnkey solution for schools and hospitals. And so when we launched it on the crowdfunding platform, we already had this like entire list of people that could be potential backers. Um, and I think that that's really the key to successful crowdfunding is you build your audience, you know, a year or two in advance. Yeah. Um, when crowdfunding campaigns fail it's largely because they don't reach enough people in the like period of time yeah well exactly. they're trying to build their audience after they have the product it seems like you reverse yeah. engineered it where you had an audience you created that exposure created awareness and then how did you get in contact with them did you pick up the phone and start cold calling these people or did you just send a you know you, you you send out a mass email saying hey 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 guys like we just went up on indiegogo look at our product you know fund we the program uh, well, I definitely made a lot of phone calls, um, but that was mostly to press uh, in order to get coverage. Like we got um, Gizmodo and TechCrunch and a whole bunch of other oh, cool. um, promotional coverage. Um, but in terms of like reaching out to your audience, I think the product that we have lends itself really well to community discussions, especially around how it can be used with children and stuff. So we we really leverage social media. We have a lot of videos on YouTube. Um, our response time is really fast when people contact us and we have we use MailChimp and and have um, segmented lists. Uh, we also used we used a, a um, contest platform called Glean. Uh, Gleam. It's G-L-E-A-M. Hmm. And you can use that to build your audience as well um, just by offering promotions for you know, people who spread the word. Fantastic. So the Indiegogo process is you have a, you obviously have to make a great video showing what you've got and then mm -hmm. you get backed by people. And then if it gets successfully funded, uh, then you get, you actually get the, like if it hits the goal, you then get the, the money, the successfully funded Indiegogo takes yeah. a, a small fee. And then after that, now you've got to ship this product to your backers, right? Is that kind of what happens yeah. next? Right. So they yeah. get a free sample for donating? Is so that? They get, they get the product. They get the actual product. For this one, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and I mean, I think the biggest challenge is that when you're crowdfunding something, generally it's super early development. So we had a working prototype, but we'd never done a factory run. And all of the time frames are like largely estimated. So oh, yeah. one of the things that you have to do after you've raised the, the funds successfully is you need to really stay in touch with your backers because they're your strongest supporters, but they could also be like, you know, your worst enemies if totally you th if they start to suspect you've taken their money and ran with it yeah um, so you know we're we have delays just like every other company that's ever crowdfunded um technology but as a general rule our backers are incredibly supportive because yeah. we keep in touch with them so. and, and are they constantly in contact with you and and what is the what is the average investment per backer like what would um, you say is it a dollar here two dollars no, no, there is it i think five hundred dollars yeah 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 it's about 500 between five and six hundred dollars per backer and mm -hmm. uh the delivery time for our product was over a year so i mean people were giving us you wow. know five six hundred dollars and had to wait a year to get whatever yeah. it is they're gonna get, gonna get the, whatever the reward the the thing that because how it works is when yeah. someone invests on Indiegogo, you have a product to give them. And my last question is: Does Indiegogo leverage their users as well with this product? Do they send this mail yeah. out to their users? Yeah, not for everybody, um, but we got we were lucky enough to get chosen, and they put the uh, they put our campaign on one of their newsletters, and that definitely boosted our our Fantastic. backers. So cool. Um, they have they have pretty good support people. You can just phone them and ask them what the best way to set up your campaign is, and they'll help you. 
Cool. Well, that's really okay. interesting. Excellent. So where can people find out more about, about everything that you're doing? Where, where can they find you? Um, well, pomotion.com, so po-motion.com okay. is the website address for the for the software. Yeah. And uh, there's a free 30-day trial and a bunch of free, um, if you go to the games catalog and just type in free in the search, there's a bunch of free effects and stuff. Sure. Um, and then... Uh, lumoplay.com is the website for the interactive projector and then we still do three or four big installations a year and if you wanted to like learn more about building projections and stuff the website for that is po-mo.com perfect and uh linkedin people can reach out meg mega tuvle yeah. Okay. It's perfect. A, it's a tough lay. Yeah, a tough lay. A tough lay. A tough yeah. lay. Yeah. We we've had a, we've had a struggle all morning with uh, with that name. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us on the uh, on the spotlight. Uh, check us out next week. Hashtag Mag on Air. Lumo Play. Po Motion. Meg a tough lay. And we'll see you next week. See you next Thanks, week. Guys.